Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. This is Evelyn Hershkowitz, Reader Services Librarian here at Turn the Page, Syosset Public Library's podcast. And today we have with us a very special guest. We have Julia Claiborne Johnson, who's the author of the best selling book, Be Frank With Me, which was a finalist for the American Book Sales Association Best Debut Novel Award. She grew up on a farm in Tennessee before moving to New York City, where she worked at Mademoiselle and Glamour magazine. She now lives in Los Angeles with her comedy writer husband and their two children. And what we're talking about today is a book called Better Luck Next Time, which actually just came out this January in paperback, but it came out last January in hardcover, which I happen to have a copy of. And I know you said in one of your interviews to take a look at the hardcover book because there is actually something on it inside. And I see it's very hard to see, but on a cloth cover. Yeah, there's a what it is, it's a, a, an imprint, uh, it's embossed. It's an embossed Pegasus because the Pegasus is the symbol of the ranch. Okay. And it's beautiful. And I never would have seen it except my daughter is such a book fiend, like the physical book, you know? And so right, she right. put the paper cover off and she's like, oh, mommy, look at this. And I was, it, it was pretty thrilling, I have right. to say. Yeah, I went to look either until I heard you say it, but I just want to read the blurb on the front, a literary sleight of hand Johnson's signature wit keeps you laughing while she quietly breaks your heart. And that's by Stephen Rowley, who is the author of Lily and the Octopus and the editor, and now The Gunkle, uh-huh. which is another book I read and absolutely adored. Mm-hmm. That was a really funny book, also The Gunkle. I love he it. is hilarious. You should talk to him on your podcast. because yeah, I really would like to reach out to him. I haven't gotten a chance to do that yet, but I certainly He is would. a joy. So, But we're here to talk about your book. Okay. <laughs> Better luck next time. Uh-huh. And why don't you tell our listeners what it is about? Because I don't like to be the one doing that because I always fear I'll give something away that I don't want to. So oh, I'd okay. prefer if you could do that for us, sure. please. Um, to, what happened was, and what made me decide to write it was that in real life, my father, who was born in 1916, he was an older father, um, had had a, a job as a fake cowboy on a divorce ranch outside of Reno in the 1930s. And um, he was like, this was a thing. And it was so much a thing that it's mentioned as a throwaway in movies all the time. But if you people have forgotten that the Reno had such a divorce industry going, but Chris and I, my husband and I were watching the apartment last week and Jack Lemon says to, or the guy who's having an affair with Shirley McLean says, well, I'll be divorced after six weeks in Reno. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> there it is. Cause you would have to go establish res- residency in the state for six weeks. And then the state could set you free. And it's in uh it's in uh, his gal Friday too. They, she mentions it in passing and, it's the kind of thing where you, if you don't know it exists, it just goes right over your head. So I always knew it existed. So I thought everybody knew it existed, but it's only because my father had had this job that I knew it. And I was like, that would be a kind of an interesting and fun topic for a novel because he was, he had an unfortunate first marriage and I'm the product of his second marriage. And I also had an unfortunate first marriage and have a second husband I've been married to for 30 years, who was the oh, wow. greatest. So like without divorce, none of this would have happened. I wouldn't be here. My children wouldn't be here. So the whole, and it's just such a matter of luck who you end up with. Like if it, you know, you think you've made a careful decision about who you're going to marry, but you, there's no way of knowing. So all of that seemed very interesting to me. And it was also interesting because Reno was a, it was a gambling hub too. And I was like, well, there's a metaphor for you that like, gambling and like marriage it right. seemed like they would go like really go together and I'd grown up on a horse farm in Tennessee so I had all this farm slash horse knowledge so I could like use all the things I knew about and and crack some jokes right <laughs> also had fun. to be sadness you know so like Funny. it seemed it seemed like it would be a good thing yeah so how much research did you have to do if you had this knowledge already I had a lot of knowledge, but I did a lot. I read everything I could get my hands on about it. And there's really not that much, but I read books about the 1930s. I read 
a lot of books about Reno, you know, what I could find and books that had been written in the 1930s. And, uh, and I went to Reno and I went to the, the, the Reno Historical Society to dig through their archives to see if I could find some trace of my father, but I didn't really know when he was there or what ranch he was on. So I was free to sort of, it was nice because then I could make up my ranch right. and not have it be one that actually existed. Because if you do something that actually exists and you get one small detail wrong, people are very quick to correct you. So it's just like, this is better. And that was really fun. So it's sort of like the farm I grew up on, except in Reno, kind of. So our main character, um, Howard or Ward, was he based mm -hmm. on your father? He's based on my father, but he's also based on my mother because my mother um, was a doc. She is still a doctor. She's 90. Oh my gosh, is she 93 now? Um, oh. And she was like, I lived in a very small town called Shelbyville, Tennessee. And she was the, you know, she wasn't, there were other doctors, but she was really popular. She had, a, she delivered millions of babies. Everybody knew her and loved her. She had a very wonderful personality, like a, a really kind heart and everything. And so a lot of the doctoring stuff came from her. And it's actually why the book is set up the way it is, because she, um, alas, has bad dementia. Oh, and um, so she had to be in a home, like you couldn't, she has to have 24 hour surveillance kind mm. of a thing. So, um, and it seemed to me so completely heartbreaking, <clears throat> excuse me, that somebody had been, who'd been so the center of so many people's lives was suddenly shuffled aside. So the narrator of the book, Ward, right. is physically frail versus mentally frail, but he's in sort of the same setup. He's a single guy. He doesn't have anybody. He doesn't have any family to take care of him. So he's living in this old folks home. There used to be, oh, I can't talk about this too much. I'll start to cry. But uh, anyway, uh, but that's sort of the setup of it yes. was that, so that's sort of the two things, like my father, there's some of my father. My father was very handsome. He was a really good dancer. He was fun to talk to. He was Southern and he, and he was um, young. As it turns out, my brother told me after the book came out, he said, you know, how old he was then and I said or how he ended up there and I said no I don't know because my father is long dead and he also fell into his senescence but because you know how when you're young and your um parents tell you a story and you just think oh god right. this one again <laughs> and, and now then, looking uh, back you're so sorry yeah, that you didn't yes, listen, oh write my, it down and everything yes right and so like by the time I was interested enough to ask questions he was not capable of answering them yeah. But anyway, so my brother, Johnny, he, he would tell my brother more than he would tell me and my sister. So he told uh, Johnny more stories. So he, Johnny knew that he had worked as a, he'd gone out West to work construction. And then he had heard about this job and thought it would be more fun than what he was doing. And that's exactly what happens with Ward. I sent Ward mm -hmm. out to work on the, the Boulder Dam and then to make him really buff, you right. know, shovel work. And so then he got this job and I was like, oh my God, I just, made it up and it was exactly how it was and Johnny said and you know he was 19 I was like what very young very young very young because I had spent a lot of time like agonizing about how Ward should be and if it would be too racy you know like anyway but his my father was 19 years old and his um when his father got wind of the fact that he'd gone there because like Ward he never didn't tell his parents what he was doing he because he didn't want them to know he figured they'd be shocked mm -hmm. And my grandfather found out what he was doing and went to Reno and dragged him home by the scruff of his neck. And that was the end of that. And so, you know, he could have been there for five years. He could have been there for six months. I don't know how long he was there, but it was really fun for me to do all the research and think about it a lot and sort of get a better understanding of what it must have been like for him. Because I think he was like, he loved the fact that he was really handsome and charming, but mm -hmm. I think it irritated him at the same time that people would just look at him as eye candy. Uh -huh. And, you know, and that's the situation I had Ward be like, people don't think he's smart because he's so he has a Southern accent and um, you know, he's working on a ranch and they don't have any sense of his background, you know? So see, I told you, I talk a lot. <laughs> it's great. I'm 
talk all you want. That's fine. I also noticed, I hope I got this right, that Barnes and Noble had it as a monthly pick in January. Yes, it was the book club pick, the national book club pick That's for Barnes fabulous. and Noble. And it was supposed to come out in the middle of um, January. But because mm -hmm. of that, they moved the pub publishing date up to January 6th. Oh, Maybe no. remember January 6th. Yes. And I, when they were doing it, and I couldn't tell anybody it was happening until like January 6th, basically. And I said to my editor, that part of January, it seems like it's going to be, that's, you know, it's going to be close to the inauguration. That could go badly. She's like, no, no, it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words. So it's a day that goes down in infamy yeah. now, right? Yeah. And we all know January 6th. Yeah. So anyway, but yes, yeah, so it was very thrilling to have that. And what's nice is Barnes and Noble printed a special edition. Oh. And in the back, it has pictures of my father and my mother. And they and they had spe special sections. And um, this book was very hard for me to write. I can go on a great length about it. But originally, I wrote it first and third person. And it just was awful. And my, my editor said, look, you're all um, voice and throwaway jokes. And this is not serving you. So this is not going to work. So it started again, and then it's in, I thought I was writing it in first person, but it, apparently when you tell it to a you, it is second person. So I wrote it in second person. Right. And um, my plan was always then the last chapter would be in third person, because there was no way for Ward to know the information he needs to know. Mm -hmm. So that was how I was going to get around it. So my editor, this we went through all of our things with it. I finally got the thing right. And she said, oh, I love what you did, everything about it. I love what you did with the end. It's really great. Except the thing is, like, if you start a book in second person, you have to finish it in second person. So you're going to have to rewrite the last chapter. And I was like, oh, and I had worked so hard on the last chapter. And she said, I really love the last chapter. I'm sorry, but, you know, you have to read it. So when they said, what do you have that we can put in a special section? I said, oh, I have that last chapter, the original last chapter. Can we use that? And it conveys basically the same information but things are different in it I hadn't read it in a while when this came up and I was like oh there are people in this version that are alive in one one version but dead in another <laughs> you know like different mm -hmm. things like slightly different things happen so it's really interesting to me to see just how like you know happenstance changed the end of it and you also find out who the you he is telling the story right. was and the name of you right. and what you does for a living. And so that's really interesting too. So, you know, if you can get your hands on that, with that version, just to see the difference. Yeah, no, I, we don't buy our books from Barnes and Noble. So yeah, I but you know, you can go stand in the aisle, <laughs> just read it. So. Okay, I'll have but, to um, do that. <laughs> yeah, because that's the only place you can get it. But I was thrilled because yeah. I had like killed myself on that last chapter. And then there it was. And in the paperback edition, which is just out, right. they have different special sections. Oh, okay. And this one, like I did a piece about my mother um, that I did for NPR. So um, that was, that's in that, this one, that's not in the other one. So, because okay. to me, my book is very light and kind of funny, but right. there's a deep undercurrent of sadness that I don't think everybody gets. But if you read the thing that I wrote for NPR, you'll be like, oh, I see. It is such a tearjerker. So anyway, okay. read at your own risk. We'll all have to go back and read that. <laughs> I know. I know. So, um, but the, the original last chapter is not a tearjerker, but it's interesting because I had read this book called, have you ever read this book? It's called um, So We Read On and it's by Maureen Cargan and it's about the writing of The Great Gatsby. And that was one of the books yeah. I read when I was writing this book because, you know, it was about somebody who'd written books in the 1930s. And um they talked, it talked about how after, I think I read this year, when Fitzgerald dropped in and he was like 45 or something, he had a heart attack and died and they went to clear out his apartment and he, they found his copy of The Great Gatsby, you know, like he had bought it at a bookstore or whatever. It was, you know, a real copy. And when they opened it up, he had done marginalia of things he would change if he could change them. Oh my goodness. And I was like, that I would love to see. Like, yeah. just because you sort of never, there's a famous Flannery O'Connor quote, which is, you never finish a novel, you just say the hell with it. Because okay. you just like, you can always find things you would want to change. Right. And that to me is super interesting. So I thought, well, maybe this will be interesting to readers to see like how slightly different it is. And yet it is the same. So, yeah. well, when your editor comes back to you after you've written this book and he wants to change the 
the way it is, how much more time does that add to this, the getting the book published? I mean, it must. Oh, well, it's before it's, it's before it's edited. So yeah. like it hasn't gone into production yet at that point. Oh, but, okay. you know, you said you mentioned that you had read Be Frank With Me. Loved and it. That, yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad. And that <laughs> book is like, I thought of the idea for the book. That book, the idea came to me when I was walking down my block. And for that, for Be Frank With Me, I thought of the idea and I knew what the last sentence was by the time I got to the end of the block. And that was the same last sentence for five years. Wow. So, so then I, you know, my editor edited it and she's like, I, you know, I love what you did with it. Everything about it's great. Except I really think she made me shorten the, get to the ending faster. And then I did. And then she said, everything you did is great. I think it's a little abrupt now. So I think you should write another chapter. I was like, you just made me cut 10 pages out. The last <laughs> line has been the last line for five years. And she said, look, you don't have to do it. Cause that was part of her pitch to me when she asked, when she was trying to get me to let her be her editor, let me, you know, choose her. Right. And, um, so she said, uh, but if you just think about it and see what you can think. And part of my, an integral part of my work process, you will laugh. I would work up until half an hour before I had to go get my children from school. And then I would take a nap for half an hour and like things would rearrange themselves in my head. And it, I would often wake up with the answer. And so for that, when I took a nap and I woke up, I was like, I know the answer now. And it was great too, because there were a couple of things that I had lost in the course of editing it. And I was like, oh, I can bring that back in and I can bring this back in. Mm. And it was so much better. And it went for me to book the book was not focused. The last line did not focus on Frank, the main character, but this last line did. So I was like, that is a smart editor when she realizes you're so close, but not quite to where it should be. So that was super gratifying. I have no idea what question you asked me. <laughs> that, that sent me off on that tangent, but there it is. Okay. So my next question would be, are you a pantser or a planner? Did you have it all? Do you I'm have it totally all? I'm totally a pantser, but here's what I do is I have a vague idea and then as I write it I keep track of it as I write it so when I finish a chapter I have a, th a large three by five um, card it's this size the people at home can't see it I don't know what the measurement of this one is but it's not the <laughs> oldest one and I distill the whole chapter onto that card onto that post-it note and I have a big piece of cardboard I pin pin the things too so I can keep track of it because it's hard I don't know if I have a secret to impart you. There are a lot of words in a novel. And it's hard there to keep track. <laughs> and like where, and you start thinking, where did that happen? And so then like I have each chapter is like that. And then I have littler poster post-it notes that are like, you know, the first line of a chapter and the last line of a chapter. And I have a, like, a, it's a very intricate system, but it's all afterwards. So, and, and Frank, like the guy in the my, my first book be frank with me he is a very opulent dresser mm -hmm. and so I had to keep track of what he had on in every scene because you don't want to like have him wearing the same thing two two scenes in a row so I had like post-it notes for attached to the post-it notes going he has this on in this one and he has that on in that one so but the people who do it ahead of time man that's that's a lot of work like I don't know how they do it I think I've been, we've spoken to quite a few authors and mystery writers have to do that because they have to be able to get to, but somebody who's writing a novel like yours, whatever comes to mind, I guess you could just write and do it. Yeah. Beautifully. So I thank that's, you the, that. that's the fun part of writing. Most mm -hmm. of writing is not that much fun. It is grueling as heck, but every now and then you go, Oh my God, I could use this like jokes that you've, for me that I, or something funny, like, okay, here's a good example. 30 years ago, somebody that I was friends with made a joke that I thought was so hilariously funny, just a throwaway joke. And it's uh, sometimes in it's something like sometimes in the course of love, uh, the magic of love has to be replaced by sleight of hand or something like that. Mm -hmm. So in this novel, Better Luck Next Time, I was like, oh my God, I can use that line. So I worked it into the thing and then I credited him. Uh -huh. And the acknowledgments. And so his mother is probably Their acknowledgments are great too, by the way. They oh, thank you. His <laughs> his mother is an older lady, also. She's probably somewhere between 80 and 90. And so many of her friends have called her and gone. I don't know what his mother's name is, but do you know that Jimmy's in the acknowledgments of this novel? You know, and they'll be like, Jimmy was my paper boy. Oh, <laughs> 
So like that, like when you can make something like that work, that's super thrilling and really fun. But it is like a, a you know, the rare oasis in the midst of the desert sands of writing. So well, both of these books I could certainly see as movies. Has there been any interest? Um so writing Better Luck Next Time, it was very grueling and I had a hard time. I had to write it three different times. And so I had terrible PTSD after it was over and it turned out, okay. I think I was just like, oh my God, out of this like train wreck, somehow this book turned out, but I was so shaken up by it that I just couldn't bear to start another novel. So I was, and I live in uh, Los Angeles and I, I don't mm-hmm. know if you know that, but um, I thought, you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll, um, uh, adapt I couldn't think of the word I'll adapt Frank into a screenplay just to keep my mind and hands busy to keep me from uh, off the streets <laughs> you know and so although of course there was no streets in March of 2020 right. so uh, <laughs> but um so I did that because I knew the story I, I always have had a soft spot for Frank blah blah and I gave it to the movie agent and she, and somebody optioned the book and the screenplay oh, so wow. that was very exciting yes thank you and, you know, that and a subway token will get you downtown because so many things get optioned, but they never get made. So mm-hmm. one has to just assume that it will never happen and go forth. But then they, I did a polish on it that was, I think, in November. We have, like, discussions about, you know, who would be in that one. Right. So who in this one, Frank? who would, well, Frank is a, a hard, you know, you, it's hard to come up with who it is because he's nine years old. So right. like. The, it's going to like, change by the time yeah change. so by the time it's a there's an older character named mr vargas and be frank with me by the time they it, it ever gets made the nine-year-old will probably be old enough to play of today who can play the old guy <laughs> you know it's like that <laughs> but um there was there's been sniffing around of this one but you know production of things has kind of ground to a halt my husband is a is a comedy writer and there was nothing to do for a while so but he um his first hollywood job was writing for beavis and butthead i know you're so proud (laughs) and he worked my kids would love that (laughs) oh my god so now because beavis and butthead is animated so now he's working on the beavis and butthead reboot so i can hear him because it's all on zoom you know i can hear him in his office laughing 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 and i'm here at my desk going oh, oh. <laughs> you know, so it's a very different life but that's but I, that's a long way of saying there's a like not a lot of production it's it's harder even than it was before right. so fingers crossed okay. it would be such a good i think it would be a limited series you know yeah, you know what? Now you have that option. Whereas years ago, it went right to movies, and now there's mm-hmm. there's so many more places that yeah, can and it, it could and like make things yeah. out of it. Yeah, if Chris used to work. My husband used to work on Frasier and like How I Met Your Mother, things like that. And there's like a set, and so you have a set for this, and then the characters go through mm-hmm. it, and that it can sustain that. So please tell everyone you know. Sure. <laughs> I unfortunately I live in New York, but I have no. I have no nobody in the industry, so no, it's not, it's <laughs> I, could put it, I could put it in people's hands and get them to read it. I can do that just so our patrons well, know we have the print book and it's also available on Overdrive in both the audio version and the ebook. And talking about the audio version, oh the audio, David Aaron Baker, the narrator, was so fabulous. Oh, Isn't my gosh. It's so good. I was about to ask you if you've heard it. It's oh. they. They I did me, both. I read and listen. So he's fantastic. And they gave me a list of like, you know, possibilities. Mm-hmm. And the person who read Be Frank with Me was female because, you know, it's a female narrator and she won an Audi, which is like an Oscar for. And right. then the whole time I was writing better, like next time I was like, oh, it's a male narrator. I can't have Pavy again. So um, anyway, they gave me a list of people and I, I read their bios and he's from the South and they're very, a lot of, um, gradations of southern accents and sort of understanding the headset of people in the south at that particular time I was like he's probably going to get it and he can do all the accents and I listened to his reel and whatever and he was so good he's an actor he was in Boardwalk Empire oh okay and a bunch of stuff so but he was amazing and you know what's great about it is like you know I don't know if you know this but I wrote that book (laughs) so so I know everything that's going to happen in it, right? Right. And so you have to listen to it to make sure that they pronounce everything correctly. Mm-hmm. So if you pronounce something wrong and 
he he called St- his name's H- uh, Howard Stovall Bennett the third is the guy's name the narrator's name and he called it Stovall so I had to go through and find every time he said Stovall to make sure that he they make a patch so I could fix them all so there's a scene toward the end where Ward and uh, Emily see each other for the last time oh god I'm spoiling it but anyway <laughs> there's um, a line in it that I found very heartbreaking call uh, where he says you don't think I'm good enough for you and I knew it was coming and the, but then the way he delivered it his voice cracked halfway through the sentence and I burst into tears I was like oh my god this is this is so sad and I wrote it I knew right. it was coming. I knew <laughs> it was gonna happen but it, that's what's so great about actors is they take yeah. you give them this raw material and then they put something on it that you never would have imagined and they elevate it and it's a great thing and I never, before I wrote novels, I never listened to audiobooks. Oh, and no? then I, how could I have been so stupid? Like this whole part of my life, because you can do chores mm-hmm. while you, I'm listening to Bleak House right now because I had to do a lot of yard work and it's really long and it's Miriam Margulies is reading it and it is pretty fantastic, I have to say. So I'm very enthusiastic about audiobook readers and my, and I've been really lucky and the ones that I had too. So. I, yeah, I'm a I'm a big fan of audiobooks. I think they're the best. They they're just so. Oh great. my god, they're yeah. like unbelievable, and I can't believe people are sniffy about them. It's like, are you crazy? They're I only mean, the best I, thing I, ever. I see all the time on social media is listening to an audiobook considered reading. I'm like, mm-hmm. of course it is. How could you even question it that? You know. Crazy. And, you know, if you get a bad reader, it's awful and right. you can't listen to it. But that's just then you read the hardcover. You right. know. But you know what? Everybody has different opinions on what's great in the audiobook world. I mean, mm-hmm. some people like heavy accents. Some people like male narrators. Some people like female narrators. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's very personal what you like. I seem to like everything. So <laughs> I've, been <lucky. laughs> yeah. I've been very lucky. I do have some of my favorites, but I still love them all. I really do. I think it's wonderful. Now, you said you didn't start writing this till you, well, you didn't publish your first novel till you were 50. Yeah, because I was a magazine. I was a magazine writer. I was a magazine writer. Writing. Yeah. So um, I worked for Mademoiselle and Glamour. And, you know, it was funny when I was, I guess I was in it at Mademoiselle, they'd send you to a fashion show and you'd stand in the back. And I'd be standing in the back watching the fashion show and think, 10 years ago, I was milking cows. And I just thought it was so thrilling. And, you know, the guy and Frank, our character, and and Mm -hmm. be frank with me, is really a clothes horse. And that was a lot of that came from writing fashion copy for like Mademoiselle, because the fashion people would come in and they'd look so amazing. They'd have these crazy ensembles on that you would never think to put together, but they were amazing. And they'd be explaining the story to you. And you know, there was one woman who wore a bustle a lot and I'd be looking at her thinking, I need a bustle. I really, <laughs> and I don't need a, no, no human being, no regular human being needs right. a bustle. They did, they could just sell it. And so I was like, that's sort of, and you'd walk down the street. It was at the Connie Nash building. It was over Brooks Brothers, right by, um, by Grand Central Station. Uh-huh. You could walk down the street and one of the fashion people would be ahead of you. And you could see people turn around to look at them. And you know, then I'd come slumping along and, and there was nobody going, oh my God, her sentences, look at her. You know, <laughs> and so that was like part of the, but I would look at the fashion people for um, uh, while they were explaining this and think, you know, you're so amazing. And people must've just beat the crap out of you when you were in middle school because they were different. Right. So that's why that character is a clothes horse because it puts sort of put a bullseye on his chest. And so, um, but when I was at Mademoiselle, I worked for the fiction editor and I had to read 10,000 manuscripts a year to find 12 that we could publish, which oh was a lot. God. And it really, t- it was such a valuable lesson. I would take nothing for it. It was grueling, but because I learned useful things is like, you can write beautiful sentences, but if you don't have a good story, there is nothing more tedious was one of them. And I didn't ever feel like I had a good story to tell. And then that's that be, be frank with me is about a kid who is um he's different he's very fashionable he's super brilliant but you know ostracized and so my daughter was 10 and she was reading um uh to kill a mockingbird for school mm-hmm. and I hadn't read it since I was 13 so I read it also 
because I thought we would talk about it. I was living in a fantasy world. Right, clearly. exactly. <laughs> I am not going to talk to me about anything. Right. But um, <laughs> so, and I was walking down my street thinking about To Kill a Mockingbird. And yeah, when you're in your, when you're 50, a book is very different to you than it was when you were 13. Right. And you I reread like, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn and totally, totally different than when I was 10. Also. Oh my God. And you know what else is uh, To Kill, uh, no, not that one. Catcher in the Rye is uh-huh. about survivor's guilt. I never understood that when I was 13. You know, and so this one, I was thinking about this and I was like, oh, Boo Radley must be on the autism spectrum. Because when I was 13, it wasn't really something that people talked about right. or really understood. And my because I had children, my next thought was, well, it'd be a lot easier to write that character than it would be to raise him. So then I thought, oh, that'd be a good book. And I don't think anybody's written that book. That's the book I'm going to write. So it's about a not. That's why the um, one of the characters is a novelist. She wrote a character like that. And then her son actually turned out to be like that because her brother had been spectrum and it kind of it's a it's a genetically linked trait sometimes so that's how that book starts <laughs> I just like went into it like I'm just there's a novel I'm gonna write it and then it worked you know so and what was great about it too is I had so much fashion knowledge from my fashion writer mm-hmm. Tom my husband's a comedy writer and we talk about comedy a lot and I love stupid jokes more than life itself almost <laughs> And I was like, and I live in Hollywood. So I was like, oh, I can take my three things, fashion, Hollywood, dumb jokes, put it into one novel and trivia. Oh my God. If you've ever been a magazine writer, you'd know so much useless trivia. I have a lot of that in my brain too. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so I was like, it's a con I can put all, cause you know, the kid knows everything. Like, so I give him all yeah. my trivia. And my favorite piece of trivia is that um, here in Los Angeles, the old Cedar Sinai building is now the Scientology Center. Oh, and wow. when I thought of this book, I was like, oh, I can use that piece of trivia. So that's one of the first pieces of trivia he tells her. And the first dumb joke, she tries to teach him how to tell jokes as a defense mechanism, because I think a lot of comedy writers are a little spectrum and they figured out if they can make the bullies laugh, they won't get beat up. Mm-hmm. And so the first joke um, that he t- that she tries to teach him is, uh, you know, horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, "Hey, buddy, why the long face?" And that's the whole joke. And he is very literal minded, and he doesn't right. understand a lot of the jokes, so she has to explain all of them, and that kind of ruins it. So it was really just like it was just a joy to be able to like, you know, put use a funnel and pour all of my favorite interests and like things I had too much of into one container so well in frank the one of the characters she is an author and she's writing her sophomore book also yes Did you relate that's to that? So <laughs> funny you bring that up so there are two things in there that i just i damned myself with one is that she can't write her second novel so as i suffered through the second novel where i just thought like i fell off a ladder doing home repairs and as i hurtled toward the cement porch i thought Oh, thank God, I won't have to finish my novel. Oh, no. know, like, maybe, like if I was on a plane and it seemed like it was going to crash. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah. But um, so I was rueful about that. And the other thing is she has a hard time naming characters. And I have a hard time naming characters. And when I was reading that, so we beat on so we read on book, uh Maureen Cargan talked about how Fitzgerald would name characters after friends of his. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. And I thought, but you know, it seems dicey to name it after friends or family members because they're going to be like, well, why'd you pick her and not me? You know, like right, that kind right. of thing. But then I was like, well, who would really love to have characters named after them? You know, who would is booksellers? And I had a lot of bookseller friends I'd made because they loved Frank. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's like when you, if somebody loves your child, you love them. Right. So, I, yeah. so there's two characters in, in Better Luck Next Time that are just straight up the names of actual booksellers. One of them is uh, Emily Summer, mm-hmm. who sells books at uh, East City Bookshop in our nation's capital. And um, Maxwell Gregory is a female and she, uh, and it's male in this book. But um she worked at uh, uh, Lake Forest Books, and mm-hmm. and so and then other names are like half of one name, half of another name, because like Nina O'Malley is named after Nina Barrett and Mary O'Malley, because Mary O'Malley, my daughter's named Mary, so I couldn't like use that name, so I, I mixed them up and I had to go through, I'd figure out when they were supposed to be born, and then I'd go on to the internet 
to see in those charts of who's named what and mm -hmm. what year. Because right. if a bookseller was named Destiny, you couldn't name like somebody born in 1905. Correct. That so, would not be but it was such a bonanza of names. I was so excited once I hit on it. And then I was talking to one of my novel students. Have you read uh, Mary Jane by Jessica? Yes, Anna? I really enjoyed that one. Yeah. She's so funny. She's so funny. We were talking. We had the same editor. And she's like, she, and she was reminded, she's like, hey, you know, I think there's a bookseller in Washington named Emily Summer. I said, yeah. <laughs> <'Cause that's what laughs> I it. And she had come across it in her books, John. Right, so she, right. Like my name, for instance, Evelyn, all of a sudden, every book I read, or I mean, so many, it's everywhere, my name. Oh, it's yeah. Like, I've noticed that too. Uh -huh. Evie Drake. Yeah. that one? Yeah, there's they're, Evie they're Drake, but they're not even not even so much the titles of the book. There's Evelyn Hugo, but even just uh, in the book, the character they're all using Evelyn and Evie as a character name, and it's a popular name all of a sudden. It's on like that hundred. I couldn't find the little, you know, driver license or things to put on uh, my bicycle because Evelyn was never there. Now it's popular. It's on everything. So oh my god, oh, that's yeah, so funny. Yeah, because so there were no Julia when I was growing up, and now they're all over the place. Yeah, Julie's a very popular name too now. It yeah. absolutely is. So I know that you wrote this book during our well before the pandemic. You said you finished it right when the pandemic started. What have you been working on now? That's the heavy side. <laughs> <laughs> did you get did you get all the the emotional import of that side? Um, I started a third novel and I wrote six chapters of it. And then I had to help my daughter move from New York to uh, she moved. She moved out of New York and then she drove cross country. And so, so I spent a month with her and then I spent a month um, polishing my screenplay. And then I went back to it and I was like, this is awful oh. what was I thinking so I think I so then I was upset because you know this is it's a terror it's a hard road to hope being a writer because you have a lot of self-doubt and there's like you know you're the one doing it you know it's coming just from your insides and so um what I did for January and it's almost over is I was like you know what I'm just putting it aside and I'm going to fix everything inside the house and outside the house that needs to be fixed because there's like a low grade anxiety about everything falling around, apart around my ears. If I can just reduce it to just the novel falling apart around my ears, that will probably be a comfort. Okay. But February starts next week. So, yeah. <laughs> and who knows like that? It, it's just like when you're dating somebody, you're like, oh, I don't know about this guy. That guy over there is kind of cute. And so like that, I'm like, oh, I've got this other idea. Maybe I should just do the other idea. So, and I was talking to uh, somebody about it last night. I was like, here's my other idea. Doesn't it sound so much better than the first idea? And she's just like, oh man, it's hard. Cause it takes years to write a novel. People who write a novel in a year, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, it takes me years, so. That's okay. We, we, we will patiently wait for your next novel. Yes, thank you. Right, cross <laughs> your fingers and say a lot of novenas or whatever mm -hmm. for me because you know who knows. Yeah, no, we will wait and with bated breath to read the next great Julie Claiborne Johnson novel because I have enjoyed both of your novels and I look forward to the next one. So hopefully great, thank you, hopefully. thank and you for for uh, doing the the good work too of giving books to people because it's hard to pick a book and then if you can get some advice, it really helps. Yeah, so. and it's one of my favorite things to do. So. Yeah, I love being able to put a good book in our patrons hands. So excellent. Yeah. Good. So you keep writing and I'll keep giving the books out. So we'll be good. OK, honey. Thank you. Okay. Julie, thank you so much, Julia. This it was, was great fun. speaking with you. And I think if we were in class together, we'd be in big trouble. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? <laughs> They'd be like God, they're like, okay, can you separate us? Like they just <laughs> me all yes, the time. They have to separate us. So, anyway. yeah, you, I'd be well, in the back. That's for sure. Because that's where they would put me. <laughs> and I'd be, it was Evelyn. She started it. <laughs> it was my fault always. And when I couldn't, <laughs> and when I couldn't talk, we would write notes and then put them like a football and click them Oh over. my God. I forgot about that. Yeah. No, totally. <laughs> now the kids just text each other and I'm sure they get in trouble for that too. But yeah, under your, like, <laughs> on your lap, like nobody's going to know. Right. They don't know what you're doing. But we <laughs> thank you so much. So this has been Turn the Page podcast from Syosset Public Library and our 
wonderful guest has been Julia Claiborne Johnson, who wrote the book, Better Luck Next Time. And her first book is Be Frank With Me. And if anybody's interested in getting them, please just give us a call over at the Rita Services desk and we'll be happy to put it on hold for you. So thank Bye. you, Julia. Have a great day and Bye, lucky honey. you in nice warm California because we have a yes. snowstorm coming. So, <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.